morning. I hope that uh, that all of you people brush your teeth this morning because there's there's a lot of us here and with all it should warm up a little bit with uh, with this many bodies. I wonder, by the way, for those of you that did brush your teeth this morning, how many of you really took took a close look or thought a lot about your toothpaste. There's a there's a couple interesting things about that tube of toothpaste that we always use. I would guess that in the in the history of toothpaste that there has seldom if ever been a case of an empty tube of toothpaste being thrown away. What happens is that somewhere during the lifespan of a tube of toothpaste an administrative decision is made that the amount of resources needed to gain more from the tube uh, just isn't worth it. And so we throw it away partially empty. Now, <clears throat> there would be no sense in telling that story if the story ended there, <clears throat> but, but we all know that sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we have to reverse our administrative decision because when we go into the, into the closet to get a new one, sometimes we find that a new one isn't there and then you know it has to happen. You, know, you go back, <clears throat> look around to make sure that no one sees, and then you go into the trash can and retrieve what had been a useless tube of toothpaste. And that gets even more complica complicated because very few people ever throw a tube of toothpaste away with the cap on. And so the first thing you have to do is it, you, by the time you get it back out of there, it usually has a full head of hair. And you take that off, you know. And then you squeeze harder, and lo and behold, here comes some more toothpaste. If you're really bad at remembering, it seems like that toothpaste will go forever, just depending on how much resource you're willing to come up with. You know, first it's just push harder with the thumb. And then sometimes you go to the double pinch. You know, and then the next one is just to lay it against the sink, you know, where you can really get a grip on it and a handle on it, you know. And then you put it up against the, hand, the, the cold water faucet where you can get a sharp edge up against it to shove. I, I've never heard, I, I would imagine that there might be people so desperate, so totally desperate as to actually rip it open, but I've never heard of one. So it turns out then that the, the toothpaste, the amount of toothpaste in there is pretty much limited by just how hard you're willing to squeeze. The second thing that's even more fascinating than that is the quality of the toothpaste you get after you've thrown it away and retrieved it is exactly the same quality as the toothpaste you got before. And that's kind of interesting. And so the first point is I'm going to give you a new label, a new labeling procedure. I think severely handicapped people are tubes of toothpaste. So are you, and so am I. I think the difference between the tubes of toothpaste that are sitting here today and the tubes of toothpaste that are back home waiting for you to come back and provide services to them, the difference between those tubes is how hard you have to squeeze to get something out of them the quality of what you get when you are willing to squeeze is exactly the same. That theme will repeat itself in a lot of different ways over the course of the three days that we're going to be here. 
you're probably going to be surprised to find out that I'm not kidding, that, that I have a very firm commitment to the premise that the difference between people is not what they're capable of doing, it's what it takes to get them there. And so in order to examine that more closely, I want to start out early this morning by taking a look at some of the things that we have tended to think and to feel about people who've been labeled handicapped and see how some of those things have stood in the way. There are some things that you and I feel and think down inside that we may not even be aware of that no matter how hard we're willing to try, no matter how much we say we feel and like those people, as long as those things sit back in there, the likelihood of us making really major changes in their lives is pretty small. And so, so let's start out by figuring out what the difference is between them and us. You know, we, there must be a difference, you know. Some of us work in those places and some of us live in those places. Some people receive funding yeah, and some people spend funds. So what is the difference? First of all, what's normal? That's a question that, that we really don't pay much attention to, is it? And yet, we must really believe we know because we don't have much trouble identifying who isn't. Now, you notice that when you came in this morning, nobody asked to see your adaptive behavior scale, okay, to make sure that you had all 99 checks. Okay, nobody checked you out on the way in. So how did you get, th how'd you get here? Why is it that you're here? Well, let me show you what normal is, okay? It's kind of a shocker but it's important for you to know, all right? I'd like you to turn and look at the person next to you. Okay, go ahead, look at the person next to you. Okay, that's normal. All right, hold it, hold it. That's only half the story. Now turn and look at the other side. Look in the other direction. Oh my. No, you notice that she's laughing too? How did you get to be that way, to be normal? Did you, did you fill up a cup? Did you take six of these and eight of those and 11 of those? I don't think so. We'd like to think that, you know, check him off here and check him off there and he's got this and this and if he gets enough, we'll let him out or something like that. That doesn't seem to be the way it happens. The way people seem to make it at one level of success or another is a, to me, look, it seems more like a balance between the things about you that are nice and the things about you that stink. That we all have that balance. And the way we remain on our jobs, in our families, in our communities, is that the sum total of the things that are nice balanced against the things that are not nice remains above zero it remains plus. And so it's just oversimplified to use labels like retardation and handicapped and severely handicapped and this and that and think that by using those that we're, that we're just describing people who are down there below zero. You take a guy like Ed Roberts for instance. Ed Roberts is the director of rehabilitation for the state of California. Uh, he's di directing a department that some years earlier he had refused him service because he was too severely handicapped. Ed Roberts has about 30 degrees arc of his left arm and that, that is a fairly complete description of Ed Roberts physically. That's it. That's all he's got. So it turns out that Ed Roberts has probably less than 1% of the body that the rest of us have and about 250 percent of the mouth. The people that work for Ed Roberts don't think of Ed Roberts as a severely handicapped person to be taken care of because he fires them and hires them and tells them what to do and tells them if they did. 
and yet here's a guy that can't feed himself at all. Someone has to be with him virtually 24 hours a day because when, when he starts losing the ability to breathe, which he does m quite frequently during the day, somebody be be better be there to put a respirator in his mouth or he's gone. And yet here's a guy, be careful about thinking of him as one of those people that is to be taken care of because he probably does a lot more taking care of than being cared for. Now let's put that into a perspective. <clears throat> I said that we needed to look at normal. Maybe if we look a little closer at normal, we can then put the concept of deviance and of competence into a better perspective. What does normal mean? Let's say that we get a little on the technical side and say let's talk about about the concept of MA and IQ. Or maybe maybe we'll still keep a general and let's talk about five-year-oldness. What's five-year-oldness? When we talk about a person with an MA of five and a CA of five, we're saying he's five. He's been here for five years and he thinks like a five-year-old. What does that mean? Well, well get a five-year-old in your mind. Okay, just think of a typical five, you got him? You know what a five-year-old is? No, you don't. The only thing you know about five-year-olds is what our particular society and culture has allowed five-year-olds to be. Five-year-oldness in this society, in this culture at this time, <clears throat> includes using an easy-bake oven, but not the real thing. It includes helping with the plastic dishes, but not with the china. It includes, in some cases, riding a go-kart at 70 miles an hour around a dirt track, but not driving an automobile at 25 miles an hour on the road. We fix that. We fix it so their nose and their toes can't be in the right place at the same time. <clears throat> Five-year-oldness in this society includes taking a bus to school or walking to school, but using public transportation in a big city alone, not very often. Now is that really five-year-oldness? Is that really what it means? In this society a hundred years ago, if you'd have seen a five-year-old walking down the street at eight o'clock in the morning with a lunch pail, what would be different? Today, if you see a kid five years old walking down the street, you don't give it a second thought, do you? He's on his way to school. All right? A hundred years ago, in this very same society, in Pennsylvania, you didn't give it a second thought either. He was going to the mines. He was going to work in the mines, and he better earn a living. Today, economic viability for five-year-olds is a disgusting thought, is an actually repulsive, disgusting thought. And yet in this very same society a hundred years ago, it was five-year-oldness. Just a few years ago. I wonder how many of you remember. You remember, five-year-olds don't read. You can give them reading readiness. You can show them pictures. You can, you can teach them the alphabet, you can read stories to them, but if you were taught teaching phonics in kindergarten, you got in a lot of trouble. You know, they're going to start twitching and, you know, their myelin sheaths aren't developed the way they're supposed to be and all that stuff. You know who snitched, by the way, it was the first grade teacher. Because if you taught them to read, what was she going to do when they got there? And then, and then some dirty little five-year-olds went and learned how to read when they were five and nothing bad happened. And all of a sudden our society says, oh, it's okay. And now phonics is perfectly legitimate in kindergarten. Now those are real major changes and yet here we are hanging on to the concept of five-year-oldness when if we just stand back and look a little bit we would see that many, many things that five-year-olds in this society don't do they don't do simply because it's a convenience to us to not have them do it. 
It's easier to do it ourselves than to go through the problems of teaching them, but there's nothing inherent in the genes or physiology of a five-year-old to keep them from doing most of the things that you and I do as adults. Now that wouldn't be so bad, except we take a guy who performs like a five-year-old on an IQ test and we chalk him off as a five-year-old. What do you suppose the difference is between a person who's five years old for one year and a person who's five years old for many, many years. Do they think the same? Do they, are they capable of doing the same thing? One of the things that our society said, God didn't say it, by the way. A five-year-old has 365 days to do it, and then he can't be five anymore. That's a decision that we made. That's just an administrative decision for keeping track. And so, when we look at five-year-oldness, at how far the physiology has developed, the cognitive structures, we forget that we are looking not only at how far those cognitive structures have developed biologically and physiologically, but the fact that they have only had 365 days to work. And then when we take somebody else who looks like that on a test, who's had 25 or 30 years and looks like that, how we can possibly imagine that the two have anything in common is beyond me. They have nothing in common. And we shouldn't think of them as having anything in common. So the next time somebody in your sheltered workshop who's six foot three and weighs 240 pounds jumps up and down and claps his hands and says, ooh, whoopee, I made another one. Uh, Look in the mirror and you'll see who decided he should act like five-year-old. Because it's not him. It's us. Now, let's go back to the terms deviance and competence that I was talking about. And let me, let me remind you now, one of the things that you guys were handed is this thing that says try another way on it. And you will find in there uh, a bunch of different things, and I'll refer to that as we go along. And one of the things that you'll find on the first two pages uh, is a list of definitions. And so when I, when I go through some of these terms and I mention definitions, uh, you may want to write down some of the things I say about them, but the definition itself you don't have to get down because it's already down for you. And if I define anything that isn't in here, uh, I'll try to remember to tell you that so you can get it. So this should save you some time. And I tried to arrange these uh, originally sort of in the order that they are to be found, but it looks to me like somebody has alphabetized them, and so they will, you'll find them alphabetically. I said before that that the way we make it is by a balance between the positives and the negatives. Well, I'd like to call the negatives deviance. And to say that deviance is defined as anything that brings negative attention. It's very simple. Almost very simple. Because that changes from time to time and place to place. If there was someone sitting in here in this room with a parka on, then the other people around would be nudging neighbors and saying, hey, can you believe? And yet, if somebody was standing outside this very hotel last January and wasn't wearing one, people would say, can you believe? <clears throat> Almost anything you can think of, from murder to different kinds of appearance, anything you could think of, there are places where that is perfectly acceptable, normal behavior and nobody gives it a second thought. And other places where it's severely deviant, where it brings a great deal of negative attention. And so the concept of a deviance is an extremely flexible, varying kind of a thing. A person moving around in a wheelchair 
brings attention. Now, you have to understand what I mean by negative attention. I don't mean badness. I don't mean that people think negative things. I mean that it causes them some concern. Those of us that work with physically handicapped people, for instance, when we're walking around the community and we find ourselves heading towards a door at the same time as a person in a wheelchair, there's some discomfort there because we say to ourselves, now is this, a, are we going to be able to pull this off right? Like should we say, may I? Or shall we just open the door? Shall we run, run the risk of the person saying, I can do it myself? Or shall we do nothing at all? All those ranges of alternatives are possible. If we say, um, may I open the door for you? And the person says, well thank you very much. That nice, but until we get there, some of us have had the experience of, of encountering people in wheelchairs that for whatever reasons found independence extremely important and at that particular place in their lives found it inconvenient and distasteful to have anyone offer. And so that, to me, falls within the general category of deviance in the sense that it causes a disequilibrium of some kind to the perceiver. And that's all I mean by it. So that's the general, that's a general definition of deviance, something that brings negative attention. The concept of competence is a little different. Competence to me is defined, and it's, you'll find it in here, is defined as something that someone has that not everyone has that's wanted and needed by someone else. One of the major shortcomings of the professions that you and I belong to is that we have rarely spent time teaching competence. We've spent virtually all of our time trying to eliminate deviance. And when we've done a perfect job of that, people end up at zero. Zero is that fine balance in the middle that says you're nowhere, you're not out and you're not in. And to me, being, being thought of as normal or accepted or whatever is to be on the plus side, is when, when you make a decision about someone, you add it all together, and that's really what you do. You do it with your spouses and everything else. You add it all together and you come up on the plus side. You'll find in there something that I call the competence deviance hypothesis which says the more competence an individual has, the more deviance will be tolerated in him by others. You take, go back to you as a spouse, okay? There's some things about you as a spouse that stink. Just ask your spouse. But there are some other things about you as a spouse that are really lovely. You can ask your spouse about those too. One way to define divorce is that for one or both members of the pair, at some point in time, the things about you that had to be tolerated started outweighing the things about you that were valued and needed and not available. We, a couple of presidents back, we had a fine example of the competence deviance hypothesis. If, if this is zero and this is, and over here is competence and over here is deviance, there isn't enough room in this room to describe Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon had phenomenal competence in many different areas. There's no question when you look at, at his pattern of activities that in a number of areas he was a phenomenally competent man. And there's no question that he also had many severe deviances. No question to some of us. But one day after a long, long time the American people said, there just isn't enough foreign diplomacy competence to outweigh all of that domestic deviance. Get out. You just dropped below zero. Then came a president 
who hovered so closely around zero that it was very difficult to make a decision. <laughs> very little in the way of competence, very little in the way of deviance, and he sat right there. Now, did I say something bad about Gerald Ford? Or did I say something bad or good about Richard Nixon? That's the interesting thing. I haven't said anything bad about anybody. Because it isn't how far out there you are, or how far out there you are, or how close or how close. It's the relationship between the two. So when, Gesundheit, so when we talk about severely handicapped people, for instance, isn't it interesting that for those people that have things about them that bring a great deal of negative attention, if we simply reconceptualized them and said, we just need something that brings at least that much positive attention, that those people would be just like you and me in terms of making it or not making it. Now, to talk about that a little further, we need to look at this concept of deviance a little more. I think there are three kinds, and you'll find them listed in, your, in the definitions. The first kind of deviance is what I call public elected deviance. And public elected deviance uh, sometimes I call that developmental deviance because as we get older, it develops out. You know, your mother says to you, don't eat your soup with a fork. You know, or uh, hey, don't, hey, don't do that. You know, what, are what are the neighbors going to think? What are people going to think? And so as you get older, you find you know, certain things, even though they're kind of fun, I don't think I'll do those anymore because they just cost too much. And then there are other things where you say to yourself, no, I'm going to do that. And if, if people can't, uh, can't deal with that, then that's too bad. As you begin to see yourself as having competencies, you become a little freer about not giving up some of those things that, yeah, maybe they bring negative, att negative attention, but I'm going to keep them anyway. It's elected. You can choose. I'll keep them or I won't keep them. And that's public elected deviance. The second category... Of, of deviance is what I call private deviance. And private deviance is really wonderful. Private de those are things that people do, everyone does. Everyone has private deviance. Those are things that you do that you really like doing and God forbid anyone should know. I used to give examples, okay, but people flush real easy. It turned out to be a beautiful diagnostic instrument. You know, I would say, for example, you know, and then, and then there'd be a, a red one over here and a red one over here. So I don't even give examples anymore. But you think you can take the, the, the gold self-administered test of private, private deviance and just say, what are some things that you do that you really like doing? But oh my goodness, if anybody knew, it would be just terrible. Now, some people say, is, is he talking about sex stuff? Well, that certainly could be a category in there. But there are lots of things that have nothing to do with that at all. I'll give you one innocuous one. I'll give you one of mine, okay? And it's some of yours, too. And if anybody flushes on this one, it's your own fault, okay? You now you're waiting, aren't you? Okay. Sometimes I like to go into the kitchen and get out the skippy, crunchy peanut butter and take an, an enormous, gigantic spoon load and just sit there and gorge myself on it, all right? But I don't do that when company's over, you know, or when anybody's around. I got caught once by my daughter, so I'm, I, I'm in trouble anyway, you know. But there, I mean, that's a, that's a nice, simple, easy one, okay? I've got to be very careful talking about private deviance. Do you know there's a couple interesting things about private deviance? First of all, one of the things that makes it so nice is it's free. You don't have to come up with a competence to balance for it unless you get caught. It's also nice that some of the, some of the niceness about it is the fact that it's secret. 
that I'm doing this cause it's so nice and nobody, I'm comfortable with it, but I know no one else would be, you say to yourself. The other interesting thing, when do the severely handicapped ever have a chance for private deviance? Never. They don't have a chance for private anything. You know what I'll bet you happens? Let's say that we considered, and, and remember I've already said that deviance and competence too, those are all relative things, those are all things that depend on the circumstance. But let's say for example, that, that there was a place or whatever where people considered masturbation to be deviant. All right, it brought negative attention. All right, and some people it was private deviance, and so it didn't bring anybody because it didn't bring any because nobody knew. You know what I'll bet happens if we use that as an example? I'll bet that there are severely handicapped people that are fired from jobs or put back in institutions or taken out of programs for masturbating where people can see them and that the very people that made the decisions to do that masturbate to. That there are people that create major disturbances in other people's lives for doing exactly the same thing that they do but they know where and when. Now that that's kind of interesting it's real. I can say it's sad. I can say it's wrong. I also have to say it's real. That's the way our society works. Our society even says sometimes, okay, do what you want to do, but don't let anybody know and it's fine. But we even say stuff like that. And then, and then we don't come up with the, with the powerful training procedures to teach severely handicapped people the rules that you and I operate under and we think something's wrong with them. It's not them at all. It's us. The third kind of deviance is what I call public non-elected deviance. And public non-elected deviance is the closest thing that I can think of to defining the difference between them and us. Public non-elected deviance, that's, that's stuff that brings negative attention that you can't elect to do or not do and it's public. People can see it. So someone who doesn't talk the way other people talk or walk the way other people walk or look the way other people look or think the way other people think. Those are examples of public non-elected deviance. Now that doesn't, being non-elected and being public doesn't mean that it can't change. For example, there's a guy in Los Angeles named Robert Shushan, S-H-U-S-H-A-N, who has done some fantastic work changing the appearance of people who don't look very good in the eyes of most people. He has taken, for instance, people with Down syndrome, mongoloid persons, and he's ha let their hair grow out instead of the old mongoloid bowl haircut, the convenient one that says, let them all look alike and ugly because it's a lot easier in the morning. And he's let their hair grow out. You know, if you're, you look at some of the people around here, there are a lot of you people here, men, whose hair covers your ears. Well, if you have little tiny ears and they're way down low, that's not a bad thing to cover. Those people, those, those Down syndrome people have epicanthal folds, don't they? Boy, that sure is a giveaway. Not if you're wearing a pair of glasses that have shaded tops, and a lot of normal people wear glasses with shaded tops. And if you have a mustache and you wear a turtleneck sweater when the, when the weather is appropriate for it and things, you know something? I could distribute a number of Down syndrome persons throughout this room with nothing more than a little simple, totally inexpensive cosmetics 
and all of you hypersensitive people who of course know those people, you know? They'd sit next to you for half of this conference before you realized who they were. They've taken people, for instance, uh, a woman that has a, 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 an appearance that brings a great deal of negative attention. She has a great big hook nose and she has two teeth, one over here and one over here and they're very long and no other teeth. And long black hair. She looks like a witch. Exactly like a witch. You know what they did? They cut her hair back to shoulder length. They taught her how to use a little makeup on the uh, over here on the sides of her nose that it just pulls the nose down. I've thought of using it but I, I, I rub my face too much. <laughs> they taught her to smile without opening her lips. So that when she smiles it's like this instead of a real smile like this which exposes a great deal of negative attention. Without seeing the slides you're going to have to take my word for it. I don't have the slides. Before they did anything with her, she was a very, very unattractive person to look at. Nice person, but very unattractive. With nothing more than a few little odds and ends changes, she is a genuinely attractive person to look at. Genuinely so. I don't mean that you'd look and say, hey, not bad for a severely retarded lady. No. I mean that if she was walking down the street and any of us were walking past her and conscious of her walking, not of who she was, but just conscious of a person walking, we'd say, hmm, what an attractive woman. Period. Period. Not considering that. There would be no considering because you can't see it. Now there's other ways to do something about public elected deviants. You can teach people to walk differently. You can teach people to think differently. And when you get down and start looking at it, isn't it interesting? There are two forms of public non-elected deviance. There are things that bring negative attention. If we talk about behavior now, not about appearance, but about behavior. There are behaviors that bring negative attention because of their presence. A person talks very strangely. A person hits other people. A person is always moving around very rapidly and never sits in one place. Those things bring negative behavior because a person has them then there's a whole range of behaviors, maybe most of the things you teach. There are behaviors that bring negative attention because of their absence. That's a really interesting distinction. He doesn't know how to use a public transportation system in a place where you're expected to. He doesn't go to the bathroom in the toilet and you're expected to. He doesn't answer questions and you're expected to. He doesn't know how to work and you're expected to. He doesn't know how to make breakfast, doesn't know how to get dressed, doesn't know how to comb his hair. All of those things bring negative attention because of their absence, not because of their presence. And if that isn't complicated, then this is. When you teach somebody one of those behaviors, you have created a nothing. If a person is experiencing, let me change that around. If there are some behaviors that a person doesn't have and those bring negative attention, when you give him those behaviors, all you do is bring him to zero. If a person walks in here like a lot of you did today and your hair is combed, you've, you're wearing clothes, you're sitting quietly, who said great? Who said to you, you brushed your hair this morning? Terrific. Okay, you're not naked. 
right on. You know? I call those zero order behaviors. And a zero, be or zero order behavior, it's, it's in there, a zero order behavior is a behavior that if you don't have it, it brings negative attention, and if you do have it, it brings nothing. You'll see when we come back to some other stuff later in the conference just how important that is. It's very, very important. If you teach all of the zero order behaviors in the world, remember, a guy's still at zero. The first time he does something wrong, he's out. In fact, in fact, let me show you how silly. Let me tell you a story. I'll give you two different versions to this story so you can get a feeling of what this means. Let's say that you, that you work in a work activity center or a sheltered workshop and you have a, a 35 year old gentleman who has been labeled severely retarded and you have really succeeded. Success in our business right now is bringing somebody to zero. Let's say if we're talking about work behavior, the people come in and they don't know how to do anything and they're very poorly adjusted. And so if you're successful, you make them very well adjusted at doing nothing. And if you're even more successful than that, you'll even go find them a place to do it. And so your placement officer goes out and lo and behold gets this person a job in a factory pushing a broom, sweeping. Isn't that wonderful? He's actually making a living. And he, you're successful because he's, he pushes okay and he doesn't say a lot of things to the people when he walks by and he lifts his feet instead of having the retardate shuffle. He doesn't stare funny at the girls. At lunchtime he sits there very nicely and eats quietly and if somebody says something he says something back. Really nice. And he shoves the broom. So you put him in this factory and after a couple of weeks a couple of people over there in aisle 10, assemblers on the bench, they go up to the foreman and they talk to him. And then the foreman goes to the personnel man and he says, he says, sir, he says, uh, we have a little problem. You know that guy that, that you hired a couple of weeks ago to sweep for us? You know, I'm so, I feel so good about the way that has worked out. People have been real nice to him and things have gone very, very nicely. There's a problem though. You know, he, yeah, he sweeps real fine and everything is fine, but I had a couple of people come up today and they said, Every time he goes past their bench, he picks his nose and he wipes it on their bench. And they don't even want to, they don't even want to work anymore. They say, it's really, you know, that, you know they, at first they thought, ah, you know, maybe once in a while or something, but it's really bad, you know? Ugh. So the personnel man says, I'll take care of it. So he thinks about it and he makes a decision. He fires the guy. Why did he fire him? It's very simple. You know, the, the well-being and the peace of mind and the esprit de corps of the labor force is very important in a factory. And we tried, you know, we really tried. And I guess we're just going to, you know, we just don't have any other choice. We'll just have to dismiss them. But we sure did try. But this is, we can't do this, you know. Well, that's one explanation. You know what the other explanation is? Who needs him? He's at zero, folks. You need the place swept, go down to manpower and get a guy out to sweep. What are you going to have to do, train him? Anybody can sweep. And if the place doesn't get swept for a while, what does that do to the accounts receivable? Nothing. What does it do to the stability of the factory? Nothing. And so here's a guy at zero. He's okay. He's at zero. But the first time something happened that can be called deviance, he's below zero. Because when you take anything minus from zero, it's minus. And so he's out. 
That's what the people are really saying. Who needs him? Now let's tell the story again. I tried, I, this version I tried to get published in Cosmopolitan and they just wouldn't, just wouldn't buy it. This is the story, same story, but it starts six months earlier. And in that factory there's a man, he's 64 and a half years old, hard worker. He operates a machine in that factory that's extremely important. It's a hard machine to operate too. It takes a normal operator at least a month of training to be able to operate that machine. And that machine must operate or the factory doesn't operate. Now that's a reality. There are a lot of machines like that out there. When a machine breaks down, the factory stops. And here's this guy, Herman. And Herman knows that he lives in a society that in six months, when he's 65, the society is going to say to him, up until now you've been perfect and from now on you're zero, out, get out, goodbye. What kind of a society that says a date is the definition of competence and deviance? So, you know, he ripped the factories important to him. So he goes to the foreman and he says, hey, you know, in six months you guys are going to throw me out of here you know, you better get somebody in here for me to teach this machine, you know. All right, Herman, don't, we'll take care of it. It's all right, we'll take care of it. And this is bothering Herman, because you know that machine means something. He's been on it for 25 years, you know. And one night he's home having dinner, and his daughter and son-in-law are over to dinner. And his son-in-law just happens to be the placement officer from the sheltered workshop. And he's talking about this problem, and the son-in-law's clicking, you know? And he says, hey, Pop, uh, let me ask you a question, you know? Would it, would it hurt your self-concept any if I suggested replacing you with a severely retarded man? And Herman says, hey, he says, you know, he says, I'm 64 and a half years old. He says, at this time in my life, if you think you can hurt my self-concept, try. <laughs> what do you mean? Tell me about it. So he tells them. They talk about it. And they start. Every night at 7 o'clock, three men walk into that factory and they work. An hour, an hour and a half, two hours, and they go home. Every night they're working. The six months passes. Comes a lunchtime, you know, and everybody gathers around and the man in the gray suit comes out, you know, and, and he says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're here today to honor. That's, isn't that interesting to honor like this, okay? We're going to honor Herman today for the wonderful service he's given us. Herman, come over here, Herman. We're so proud of you that we're going to fire you and everything. In fact, Herman, I'd like to hear, here you go. We'd like to give this to you so that you can go somewhere and sit down and look at it go round and round and round. Okay? Bye-bye. And then all of a sudden things get real quiet and the foreman says, hey, uh, wait a minute, um, the machine I forgot. And, there, and the president looks around and says, well, wait a minute, you mean there's nobody to operate the machine? And it's, Herman waits a second, you know, timing is very important. And he says, no problem, I've taken care of that. He says, hey Fred. And people look over and here's this guy, strange, kind of strange looking guy, you know? Doesn't make eye contact very well, you know, kind of looks around. He says, Fred, come on, Fred. And what, what's this? Stray walks a little strangely. Walks over to the machine and sits down, and the machine comes alive. And the people look and they say, far out. Wow, the machine, because they were sitting there thinking, a month home with no bread? Uh-oh. Herman says, bye, takes his watch and goes. His son-in-law stands way back over in a corner with his fingers crossed watching. And the factory goes back to work. Two weeks go by. Same two weeks as in the first story. A couple of people walk up to the foreman, the same people. The foreman goes to the personnel man. The personnel man thinks about it. The personnel man calls in the custodian and he says, sir, he says, I'm very sorry to bother you, but he says, I have really no alternative. He says, from now on, 
at least two or three times a week. Go over to the machine over there on aisle 10 and clean all the boogers off of it. <laughs> you, just, you just sit there and laugh, folks. How many of your people have gotten thrown off of jobs for nothing more than that because who needed them? And at the same time, you tell me any person in a business in his right mind that would close down a factory for 30 days because someone picked their nose. No one in their right mind. Do you see what competence means? Do you see that deviance is relative? That it really doesn't matter what you do that brings negative attention? It matters how it relates to what you do that's wanted and a need and needed and not available somewhere else. So we've missed the boat. We have been so worried about those people not having all of those things that people don't like that we have failed to realize that it doesn't matter. The balance matters. Now, if we have a person that's not toilet trained, the idea of, of that person working in a factory in diapers is pretty far out. I don't, I don't think very many people would hire anybody in diapers, no. I'm not suggesting to you that we should ignore deviance. I'm not suggesting to you that we should act in a way that says, ah, don't worry, we'll just build competence. What I'm saying is, is whatever time we're spending now trying to eliminate deviance, we had better start spending at least as much time building competence, giving them things that are wanted and needed and not available in anybody. Okay. The last little look that I'd like to take at the insides of your mind and what happens in there that causes us so many problems is I'd like to point out to you that you have you have a card system back there and that that card system is causing problems. What card do you suppose pops up when you see somebody walk in this conference with a cane with a red tip on the end of it and they're moving their hand like this? Or you walk in to a course somewhere at the university and someone raises his hand to speak and blocks. I kick it like that. Or when you walk in somewhere and here is somebody sitting at a typewriter and working and they're in a wheelchair. You know what happens? Or you see a guy like Ed Roberts as totally physically handicapped as he is, when you walk into his office, it's pretty obvious that he directs a very, very large organization. There's a card back up in there that says, I am looking at an intact system with one or more malfunctioning subsystems. You didn't know you had that card, did you? Some of you, your card reads a little more simply. It says, he's just like me, but his eyes don't work. He's just like me, but his legs don't work. He's just like me, but he can't hear. But there's a card that pops up in there that basically says, he's an intact system. There is a subsystem that's out of whack. That's a nice card. Keep that card. You've got another card. That's the one I'm really after. When you walk into an institution and there's somebody sitting there going like this. When you walk into a workshop and here's a guy that's as tall as you and as handsome as you and he says, good morning, hello, I like your shirt. You know, a different card pops up. A card pops up that says, this is a malfunctioning system.
for those of you that have the other wording, it says, this one's not like me. You know what that card does to you? Remember now, you live in a society that has a nice set of rules about those things. This society says, if you have an intact system with a malfunctioning system, fix it. If you have a malfunctioning system, junk it. Let's use the automobile as a perfect example. Okay, you, you pull in the driveway, you go in the house, you go to sleep. You wake up the next morning, you come out, you put your key in the car, you turn it, and nothing happens. What? You're kidding. You try it again, right? Okay, nothing. So you call the gas station, the guy comes out, picks up the hood, takes his little instruments, does a little fooling around, and he says to you, first of all, your battery is dead. And you say to him, I didn't need to call you to know that. Yeah, but a cell is bad. Also, your alternator is, is not working. And while it has nothing to do with this problem, I notice that the air is showing through in your tires. And so what do you do? You say to yourself, this is a perfectly intact system. I drove it in here last night. Fix it. That's it. Of course. That's car number one. Car number two. You don't see him much here in Wisconsin. You see him in Kentucky, in North Carolina, Tennessee. Sits out in front of the house. Okay? No wheels. No windows. The hood is nowhere to be found. The carburetor is nowhere to be found. The seats are all ripped out. Can you imagine now a guy, you're walking out in front of the house and, he, and you look at the car and he says to you, do you know that, that the transmission in that car is perfect? car had a tune-up just 6,000 miles ago. Th that, that car has the best 8-track of any car I've ever owned. Who cares? Who ever, except for the junk man, who ever looks at intact subsystems that belong to a malfunctioning system? Nobody bothers. Nobody cares. Not in this society they don't. Junk it. Easy decision. Now the third car. I call it the borderline car. We've all had them. Some of you have them right. Some of you drove them today. Okay? Needs rings and valves. Needs a set of tires. Needs a new alternator. Needs upholstery. And the radio needs fixing. You know what? There's only one problem with the car. Deciding if it's a malfunctioning system or an intact system with malfunctioning subsystems. That's your only problem, folks. Because once that decision is made, it's all easy. You say to yourself, junk it. Don't pour good money after bad. What's the sense of doing this? That's going to happen. You know, you come up with all the reasons after it's happened. Or you say to yourself, but I love that car. I've had, I've had that car for, for seven years. You don't just get rid of something you've had for seven years, you know. That's it. And you go, you go, and you start, your friends say, are you nuts? You're going to put radials on that? And you say, hold it, Charlie. Don't say that about that. If I put a thousand dollars into that car, and I know that car, all right, what are you going to go out and spend a thousand dollars on that'll touch it? See, you got all the rhetoric. The rhetoric comes after. You make a basic decision. That's an intact system. Now, what about those people sitting in central Wisconsin colony? sitting in classes for the severely and profoundly handicapped in the Milwaukee schools, sitting in St. Coletta's. As much as you love them, as much as you feel yourself to be a worthwhile, considerate, lovely human being, as long as that second card pops up, folks, and it's still popping up, as long as that second card pops up, they don't have a chance. Because inherently in what you do, they won't make it. Now one of the things that I'm going to do 
during this conference, and I'm going to start out immediately after we take a break, is I'm going to destroy that second card. One of my goals here is for you to walk out genuinely believing, not rhetorically, not religiously, no, none of that, but walk out saying, you know, I have chalked him off. I have decided things about her that I have no business deciding and I better go look a lot closer because maybe she is an intact system and I've got a lot of work to do on the malfunctioning subsystems and when I do look out. So one of my roles and it's a funny role to be in is for those of you that are happy I have to stop that. I have to make you dissatisfied. I'd like to turn around and say I hope I make you a lot happier by, by adding two things are adding more to two things that some of you already have. One of them is very high expectancies for them. And number two is a means for achieving those expectancies. After the break, I'm going to try to put into perspective the relationships between the feelings that I've been talking about and the technology that I'm going to be talking about and give you a feeling for what try another way means and, and really then m begin to zero in on what the conference is all about. I'll see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>